Hello everybody, uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, uh, beginning with chapter 18, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, please go back and watch this from the beginning. This is the most important book of the entire Bible. All right, now I'm a KJV firstist, which means that I, I like to read the verse in the KJV first. And if I think it might be helpful, then I'm willing to look at other translations. The one I prefer to use is the Amplified, because it's a kind of a combination between a translation and a commentary. Sometimes I find that to be helpful. Okay, so let's begin John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. So, here we are. Uh, a very dramatic scene is unfolding here. Jesus is in the garden with his apostles. Judas has already betrayed him, and now Judas is leading the um, chief priests and Pharisees with officers from them to come to arrest Jesus. Let me see how that is phrased in the in the Amplified. Uh, having said these things, Jesus left with his disciples and went across the ravine of the Kidron. That's spelled with a K, so uh, I guess it's pronounced Kidron. Uh, there was a garden there, which he and his disciples entered. Uh, now Judas, who was betraying him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having obtained the Roman cohort, Court and some officers from the high priests and the Pharisees came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Well, here it says that he has the uh, his Roman obtained the Roman cohort. Let me see what it says. B under cohort. There's a footnote. A cohort was a subunit. Of a Roman legion and normally was composed of about 600 troops but could be fewer in number. The Jewish religious leaders probably made arrangements with Pilate for Judas to have temporary use of the troops. Hmm. Wow. I have never envisioned uh, that a number that large coming to arrest Jesus. And I think it's all been portrayed in, in the movies that uh, there were maybe 10 or, or 20, a small number. So you have the Roman cohort and you have uh, uh, officers, some officers uh, from the, the Pharisees, the high priest's office. And they have weapons. All right, let's go to verse 4 in the KJV. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Of course, Jesus knew who they were seeking. A lot of times, Jesus asked questions, and often, even uh, in the Genesis accounts uh, in the Garden of Eden after the fall, you know, it's interesting how 
um, God would ask a question of Adam and Eve. And of course, God knows the answer, but God asked the question. It's kind of a rhetorical question in a way, but this is the way that God is, uh, you know, communicating and for some reason. Now, verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. Now, I am he is, uh, when it says, Jesus says the term, I am. Uh, we, we take that as a title for God. Because when uh, with uh, with Moses, or perhaps it was with Abraham, I'm not sure, maybe both, uh, when the, God was asked his name, he says, I am. So it's it's the name of God, I am. And when Jesus uses that, then it's a way of him declaring that he is God, and not only Am I concluding that? But we can see by the reaction often of uh, the Jewish people that when Jesus talks like that, uh, he is declaring his, his deity. So Jesus says, I am he in this case. I am Jesus of Nazareth whom, whom you seek. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Let me read this. Uh, Verse 4 and 5 in the Amplified now. Then Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, went to them and asked, Whom do you want? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said, I am he. And Judas, who was betraying him, was also standing with them. So no additional information there in the Amplified. And back to the KJV, verse 6. As soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. So when Jesus says, I am he, something powerful happened. All the, I guess the the Roman cohort and the officers and the pre people from the uh, the Pharisees that from the chief priest's office that they, they are all fell backwards. It says uh, they went backwards and fell to the ground. You know when you watch uh, people like Benny Hinn. And, uh, and the like uh, do this theatrical thing at, like uh, touching someone in their head or waving his arms and, and people are all falling backwards. Um, I've never understood anything uh, biblical that would, could justify that. It, it, it seems unbiblical. The only thing I th think that they could possibly use to support this kind of a power is um, is this thing that's happening here in the garden. And Jesus says, I am he, and they all fell backwards. But uh, it's, it's very presumptuous, and I think false. I'm, I'm not a fan or supporter of Benny Hinn or any of these uh, uh, people like that. that they that they would um, want us to believe that they have this kind of power from the Holy Spirit, I guess, that they could just touch someone, they fall backwards. I, I believe that what happens in Benny Hinn's case, at least, is that it's um, the power of um, self of, of hip, group hypnosis. Uh, also, the power of peer pressure. If you're among a lot of people and they're all responding in a certain way, it takes a strong character to uh, not conform and, and fall backwards along with the group. Uh, but I think Brother Ronnie said that he was uh, in a crowd like that once and he, he didn't 
fall backwards. I mean, he wasn't going to go along with it and just either be respond because of uh, some kind of group hypnosis that was affecting them. Uh, he he wasn't under that power, and he wasn't going to fake it just to just to go along with the group and and. Uh, he was. He had strength of character. He didn't fall backwards. You know, uh, I wish more people like were like that. He had the kind of character to not, not conform. Uh, but it, it, it takes a strong character to not fall under that kind of peer pressure. But in, 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 in this case, in the garden, though, this was an actual power from G of Jesus or the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, "I am He," they fell backwards. Something knocked them the ground. Let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Uh, verse 6, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Okay, no, no additional information. So back to verse 7 in the, in the KJV. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus asked this same question again. Whom seek ye? Um, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So this is being, this is applying this verse, this prophetic verse, uh, to this particular case in the garden. And then uh, many people interpret that verse, uh, this was uh, in the last chapter, if I recall correctly, the statement also, uh, and and I I think that most people interpret the verse to mean that when he says I have lost none to be much broader than we're we're seeing it here, but this seems to be restricted to this group of people, his apostles, in, in this uh, this event in the garden. Uh, so let's read that in the Amplified. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you want me, let these men go their way. This was to fulfill and verify the words he had spoken of those whom you have given me. I have not lost even one. I don't know. There's no footnote connecting this to some Old Testament prophecy. Okay. So now back to the KJV and verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, Peter gets a lot of criticism for denying Jesus three times and hiding for his life. He was in fear for his life. Like all the apostles, except for John. John was the exception. But uh, they, they didn't want to get arrested and uh, they didn't want to be, could be tried and suffer whatever was going to happen to Jesus. They didn't want to be part of that, so they hid. And so we all consider this a, as a, you know, a great disappointment that they would be do that. But I think it, it does illustrate that they were cowards at that time, and then they were bold um, witnesses after the resurrection. So this is this is a very strong argument to support. The resurrection is being an actual, factual event, a bodily resurrection, because the resurrection 
when they saw that Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, they were so their, their faith was so strengthened that they were converted from cowards hiding for their lives to bold witnesses who would go on all of them to martyrs' deaths um, because of their testimony of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, so they when when it says here that. Uh, Peter drew his sword and smote the high servant. Here we have an example. Of before he was a coward, he was brave. He told Jesus, he, earlier, he told Jesus when Jesus was telling everybody what how this would all play out and that he would die. And Peter, as usual, was always the first to speak up. He said, no, Lord, I'm, uh, I'll die with you. And you see, here's... He was willing at this point to die, to, to fight. He pulled his sword. He was willing to fight and defend Jesus. So he, he, he was brave and willing to fight, defend, and, and, and die for Jesus at that moment. And yet, after that, he, the fear takes over him. And he's a coward. And he denies Jesus three times. And then later on, after the resurrection, he and the other apostles are, are converted into bold, courageous witnesses. Um, so, uh, verse 10 again. Now, let me read that in the Amplified. It says, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. All right, verse 11 in the KJV says, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Of course, they didn't understand the big picture, the real mission that Jesus came to, to fulfill, the, the reason God was manifest in the flesh. He, he had to take on flesh. He had to become a man in order to die. Uh, God cannot die. So if, if he's going to pay for our sins with his death, he had to become a man in order to do that. And they, uh, even though the Old Testament is, is full of, uh, of prophecies about this, and, and, and there's there's many different, what we refer to as pictures and shadows. These are things that are telling us about what's going to happen in the future, but it's, it's veiled. And it's uh, people in, at that time, as it played out in the Old Testament, they didn't understand the actual meaning of these things. Uh, there, there, there's dozens and dozens of these things. I'll give you one example is when Moses is uh, standing with his arms up, and the Israelites uh, are winning a battle. And, and but when his hands come down, they are losing the battle. So I think it's uh, Joshua and maybe maybe Moses' his brother. There were two people, one on each side of them, that would hold help Moses by holding up his arms. But Moses and these two is a picture of Jesus on the cross and the two, th two thieves, two criminals on, on each side of him. Um, so uh, looking back, we can see these pictures that give us a, uh, we, can, we can see clearly how, how this is a prophetic of this future event. But at the time, people didn't understand the meaning of these things. And so, even now, as this is playing out in the garden, uh, the, 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 the people there, apart from Jesus, really still didn't understand the meaning of all the things and, and, and the, the, the actual reason Jesus came into the world and his, his real mission. They were still confused, thinking that he was coming to set up a kingdom and, and to be the Messiah and, and to... to 
you can't throw out Rome and have Israel and he'd be the king of Israel. I mean, they didn't really understand that his coming was to die for our sins. Uh, so uh, let me read the, this. Uh, can I read that in the Amplified the Service of God? Oh, yeah. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So, of course, this cup which the Father hath given Jesus is this suffering and death on the cross to pay for our sins. This was the whole point of him becoming a man. And Jesus said at one point, he said, I do not think that I came to be served, but rather to serve and to give my life as a ransom. So he tells us there that the reason he came down from heaven and became a man was to serve. How did he serve? Well, he, he served mankind by washing the feet of the apostles and saying, this is an example I'm giving you. Uh, and by all the things he said and all the things he taught us. But his primary mission was to give us life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. And so Jesus came to give his life as a ransom, his right life, his death on that cross uh, served as a payment to set us free from judgment and condemnation. Uh, let's read that in the Amplified now. Let's see. Verse 11. Um, so Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Okay, now verse 12 in the KJV says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. See, there's nothing in this, this uh, book of John, this account, that talks about Jesus healing Malchus' ear. I can see unless we're coming to it. Uh, unless, but it looks like uh, there, there is an account of, okay, Peter cut off this ear. He swung the sword and it, uh, it didn't kill. It wasn't a lethal blow, but it was damaged Malchus the way where his ear was cut off. And in other accounts, Jesus attached the ear and healed it. He did the miraculous sign in front of everybody. Um, now verse 13 and, and led him away to Annas first for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas which was the high priest that same year now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people now when Caiaphas said that earlier, in an earlier part of this, uh, I believe we covered this in John, and when Caiaphas said that Jesus needed to be arrested and he needed to die, otherwise the whole nation could die, because Caiaphas didn't understand the prophetic meaning behind this. Uh, he was thinking that Jesus would have to die because if Jesus continued built, getting support for him as the Messiah and the people wanted to revolt against Rome and, and put Jesus as their king it, this kind of rebellion would be put down by Rome and you know, the whole nation uh, as they knew it then could just be destroyed so to save the nation of Israel even though they're under the rule of Rome Caiaphas thought that Jesus had to die for the sake of the nation but what he didn't understand is that statement was prophetic. He had to die for, for, the, for the sake of the nation and the whole world. Uh, his death would, would be that significant. Now, um, verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. When it's, it says another disciple, in this case it's... Uh, 
we, we have to conclude that this is John, but he doesn't mention his name. But John is this other disciple. This is, and Simon Peter followed Jesus. They arrested him. Everybody fled, but Peter followed Jesus and another disciple, and that was John. That disciple was known unto the high priest, so, so the high priest knew John, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So John was there observing everything. John, as I've said this many times, John's the only one that was never left Jesus' side through all of this. He was there in the garden. He, he didn't leave and hide his, uh, desert Jesus as the others did. He was there even during the trial and then at the cross. The only one. He had the two Marys and he had John. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and the Apostle John at the cross. Verse 16, but Peter stood at the door without. So Jesus wasn't inside the, um, let me see, verse 15 says, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace. So John is inside the palace. I'm assuming that he's there observing the trial. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. So John spoke to someone who was at the door, kind of like a, a, door, a doorman, a door, in this case it was a woman. Unto her. It says, and spake unto her that kept the door. So there was a woman, you know, in charge of letting people in or out. And John spoke to her and got permission for Peter to be brought in. Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? So I, I think the woman. Um, uh, when she says, Art thou not thou also one of this man's disciples? That makes me think that she was aware that John was a disciple of Jesus. John was not denying it, John was not concealing it. Uh, he was not afraid uh, to, even at that point, that place, and that time, he was not afraid that. Uh, you know, well, they're going to arrest me and put me on trial too. But the other apostles were. And we can see how Peter's reaction, that he was afraid for his life at this point. But, but John wasn't. So she says, Art thou not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, this is Peter, he saith, I am not. So he denies he's a disciple of Jesus. Uh, let me read this portion in the Amplified. It says, um, So the other disciple, and we'll see here in the Amplified, it inserts in parentheses the name John. So they're stating what I was stating in my uh, explanation of this. Uh, they, they actually insert his name. It says, So the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter inside. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? Well, I don't like the way that's phrased there. Uh, I think it's important for this, uh, the way it says it in the KJV here, uh, it says that uh, also, it says, uh, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? Because it's phrased that way, we, we know that John is not um, hiding the fact that he's uh, one of the apostles or disciples. Uh, and then he says, you are, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now verse 18 in the KJV says, And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Nine, verse 19, The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Let me read verse 19 in the KJV. It says, so. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. So it never stood out to me before that Jesus was queried about his disciples at this point. So they see they not only were, you know, putting Jesus on trial here, but they they also, I think, as did intend on squashing this whole group, Jesus and his followers. So they wanted to know about his disciples too. Uh, it says, then the high priest asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. So, you know, Jesus is saying here, and he, he said what he, uh, what he taught, he taught openly publicly. And everybody knows what he taught, including probably the people who were asking him these questions at that very time. They were very much aware of what he taught. It wasn't some kind of a secret teaching, like the the Gnostics. Uh, verse 21, Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me, which I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? So, the beginning of violence against Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Let me read verse 23 in the Amplified. If I have said anything wrong, make a formal statement about the wrong. But if I spoke properly, why did you strike me? So Jesus is standing up for himself in this injustice and, and uh, de declaring, hey, as he said before, uh, he said that, uh, who convinces me of sin? Who, 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 is, who can show that I've ever sinned? Now, we encounter some people here on YouTube and in the world that are very religious and self-righteous and, and, and actually would say the same thing. You, you think that I sin? I don't sin any longer. That's how they say it. That's what they believe. They claim that they've completely stopped their sinning. Most people don't claim that they've never sinned their entire life. That's very rare to find someone that deluded. But many professing Christians say that once they put their faith in Jesus, then they completely stop sinning. And the scriptures tell us that if we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, uh, and that, that is, is, applies to us before we put our faith in Jesus, and even after we put our faith in Jesus. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But Jesus can make the claim. Who convinces me of sin? He claims, I've never sinned. And um, verse 23 says, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why is my Verse 24, Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples who denied it, and said, 
I am not. Strike two. Verse 26. One of the servants one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. So Jesus had prophesied when Peter said, Lord, no, not so. You're not going to, not going to die. And Jesus was telling about his death and his resurrection. Peter, as I said earlier, said, no, you're not going to die. I will die defending you. And he did, he did attempt to, to defend him. He cut off the ear of Malchus. Uh, but at that time, before that, when Peter was boasting about how he had not, he would not let Jesus die. He will die defending him. Um, Jesus said, you're going, to, you're going to deny he even knew me three times. Peter was in denial about his denial. He didn't believe it. But here he is. And of course, Jesus said that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And this is it. Verse 27, Peter then denied again, third time. And immediately the cock crew, the rooster crowed. Um, verse 28. Then led they from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall. Uh, lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Verse 20 in the Amplified says, uh, 28, Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, the governor's palace. Now was early, and the Jews did not enter the Praetorium so that they would not be ceremonial unclean, so they didn't want to be around any Gentiles. That would make them unclean. The Jews were very uh, racist in their, in, their, in their respect. And, and, and the, the Jews believed that they needed to stay separate and not associate, have anything to do with non-Jews. So they didn't want to go to the Praetorium uh, where Governor, Governor Pontius Pilate was, and any other Gentiles, they, they said, uh, Now it was early, and the Jews did not enter the Praetorium, so they would not be ceremonial unclean. If you associate with a Gentile, you're unclean. But we might be able to eat and participate in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which began after the Passover Supper. Now the Passover Supper, uh, originally started when Moses was um, performing the miracles before uh, the uh, uh, what was the, the leader of, uh, of Egypt? Gosh, I forgot what he's called. He's not a king. Uh, so Moses was saying, let the people go, leave Egypt. And, and then it was, he performed all these uh, curses against Egypt. And then the final one was uh, death would come to the firstborn of all of Egypt. And God instructed Moses to kill a lamb. So this is killing a lamb, this picture of the lamb of God being killed and his blood being shed. And then the, the blood of the lamb 
they were, they were instructed to put the blood above the doorstep. So imagine the doorway to your house, and you're told, take this lamb blood and put it at the top and on each side of the doorway. This is a picture of the cross. The blood of Jesus' head and the blood of the blood on each side, the blood on his hands as he fell on the cross. This is a picture of the death on the cross. And I imagine some of the blood probably fell from the top portion and fell off the ground. So this is a picture of Jesus' death on the cross. And, and all the, the Jewish people did that, and death came to take, to take the firstborn of all of Israel, of, of everybody in Egypt. But the Jews who did this uh, blood, this symbol here, that passed over that house and did not take the, the life of the firstborn. So that's what the Passover is, and they celebrated it annually after every year in the Tibet. And they celebrate this. And, but it's a picture of Jesus' death for our sins. And if we put our faith in that, then that passes us by. So, let me see, they did not want to be ceremonially unclean by associating with the, the Gentiles, otherwise they would not be allowed to participate in this Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover Supper. So they are going to, about to have it, and then Jesus' death uh, on the cross is coincides perfectly with the time that the Jews performed this um, sacrifice of the lamb being killed and the, having this Passover supper. Um, so it, it's perfect timing. It's, it's God's timing. As the Jews celebrated the Passover feast, the, the lamb was killed. The lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was killed. Verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. Amazing how sarcastic and they, they, would, they are with uh, the governor. You know? surprises me they're kind of uh, maybe they're just so confident that the government didn't want, did not want some kind of an uprising that they, they felt like you'd talk like that but they were really afraid that's why Jesus was arrested and taken to them so that he could die so that the nation could be spared according to what Caiaphas said and so it seemed like they'd be more careful about uh, offending uh, Pontius Pilate the governor then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us, for us to put any man to death. Now, I don't understand that, because I know that they, they stoned people. It was very common. They were going to stone the, the, uh, the prostitute when Jesus said to them, they asked Jesus what should be done, and he said, He who has not sinned, cast, let him cast the first stone. So they were going to stone this prostitute, and uh, many times they wanted to stone Jesus or cast him off a cliff. They wanted to sentence the sentence of death. They wanted to impose that on Jesus and other people, you see. So it seemed to be common that, that they did uh, use capital punishment. But maybe it wasn't lawful. Maybe the Jews did not want them to, to do it. I mean, maybe the Romans uh, wouldn't permit it, but they seem to be doing it anyway. But in this case, they're saying it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Well, that would be maybe according to Roman law, but according to the Jewish law, it was lawful. 
verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Uh, so, in other words, if, if the Jews put him to death, it would be stoning. But if the Romans put him to death, it would be crucifixion. And if you read uh, Isaiah chapter 53 and uh, Psalm 20, chapter 22, this is uh, David was a thousand years before Jesus when he wrote the Psalms. Isaiah was 700 years before Jesus when he wrote this book of Isaiah. That far ahead, you can see clearly in those chapters, it, it, it's a graphic explanation of this crucifixion. Now this was 700 and a thousand years, or, you know, hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented and used by the Romans. And yet the prophecy uh, describes it quite graphically. Uh, but so the prophecy said that the Messiah would die in this way, and so it was necessary for Jesus, Jesus to be put to death by Rome rather than the Jews. So it was crucifixion rather than stoning. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Say, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of thee? So does Jesus not know where, how Pilate came up with this idea? Uh, is he being rhetor asking rhetorical questions again? Or is he just asking questions because that's how God dialogues uh, with us, as I pointed out earlier. Verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and their chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. See, this is another thing that I have a playlist about dispensationalism and about uh, the Millennial Kingdom, about uh, the Rapture. And, uh, I, knew, uh, I forgot the title of the video, I, the playlist. I think it's Dispensationalism, Futurism, Millennialism. Uh, and uh, I'm convinced that this idea of a literal kingdom where Jesus is going to be king for a thousand years on the earth is incorrect. I believe it's a spiritual kingdom because here Jesus says it and several other times Jesus says that my kingdom is not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. He says, do not say uh, low here or low there is the kingdom. And I can't identify it as a place on earth. Uh, you, it, it, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. And Jesus established this kingdom of God in his in his lifetime. That's when he started it. And um, all of us who put our faith in Jesus, we have, we are in the kingdom of God. That's that's what uh, salvation is. We're, it's a spiritual kingdom that we're part of now. So if you're one of these that believes in a literal thousand year millennial kingdom where Jesus is going to be king on the earth, then I, I, I suggest that you watch my playlist on dispensationalism, and uh, it, it's now uh, whether you end up agreeing with me on this or not. It's, uh, it's I don't really care, but uh, that's how I see it. And I think there's a pretty, if you're willing to look at the other viewpoint on this, the, the other side of the arguments on this, you'll see why I come to that conclusion. But so Jesus says, "My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world." Then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? 
And when he had said this, he went out again into the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Well, Pilate asked, what is truth? We don't have Jesus telling Pilate what the truth is here, but at other point in time, if Jesus did tell us what the truth is, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus, there's a, a lot of names for Jesus, and a lot of ways of identifying, describing Jesus. I have a playlist of the identity of Jesus. And it's probably, you know, 10 or 12 hours long. But it examines all, all the verses in the Bible that give us some kind of a title or name or adjective about Jesus. And, and uh, of course, one of the names for him is the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth that you need to believe. You need to believe in Jesus. If, that is, if you have the desire to receive the gift of life everlasting in the kingdom of God, then, uh, then you need to believe on Jesus. Believe he is the truth. Uh, but Pilate says, I find no fault in him at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So Pilate obviously did, thought Jesus was innocent. And he was finding a, trying to find a way of releasing him. And he said, yeah, I have a custom. There's a custom here. This time of year, we will release the prisoner. How about if I just release Jesus to you? And that's satisfying. They said, no, we don't want Jesus released. We'd rather have a robber, rob us. And he was also known as a murderer. Let me read this last portion of the Amplified here. We're starting with verse 33. So Pilate went into the praetorium again and called Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own people and their chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done that is worthy of death? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world, nor does it have its origin in this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. This is why I was born. And for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, who is a friend of the truth and belongs to the truth, hears and listens carefully to my voice. Pilate said to him scornfully, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no guilt in him, no crime, no cause for an accusation. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover, so shall I release for you the king of the Jews? Then they all shouted back again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. I'll begin with chapter 19 next time. Let me conclude, though, with a uh, final thoughts uh, and uh, the gospel message. Um, this book of John is, as I said, the most important book in the whole Bible. We learn who Jesus is, why he came into this world, why we need to believe in him, what is, what is the means of salvation, how do we, what are we, is required of us in order to go to heaven. All this we learn from the book of John, the book of John in the States. Uh, and then I think it's chapter 21, it states that uh, the reason the book was written was to tell us how to receive the gift of salvation. 
by believing in Jesus. So um, it's a very important book. In this chapter, I'm sure that um, if you listen carefully, you've learned a lot, but you, I don't want you to miss the most important thing of all. And that is, do you want to receive the gift of eternal life? Do you want to go to heaven, so to speak? If you do, then it's important to understand what's required of you. The Bible tells us that we cannot go to heaven based upon personal merit. You cannot say, well, I'll become a religious person and follow all the religious rules and, and uh, you know, abstain from sin and do a lot of good deeds. And, and then when I die, God will judge me and say, you've done very good. I'll let you go to heaven. That's the philosophy of the world. And that's what all the religions teach. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that, that system, that, that uh, method is doomed to failure because what they would be required of you is you'd have to be perfect. You'd have to be able to go to God at the judgment and say, I've never sinned one time my entire life. That's the standard that we see in the Bible. That's the standard that's required if we want to go to heaven based upon our own righteousness. So what, what are we to do? You can see that it's impossible for me ever go to God and say, I've never sinned once in my whole life. So the Bible says there is another way. There is one way to go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the only way to get into heaven. You need to reject all other ways. You need to reject all the religions of the world. Buddha's not the way, Muhammad's not the way, uh, the Pope's not the way, the Virgin Mary's not the way. You're not the way through personal effort and striving to be good. None of those are the way. Jesus, I'm the way, the one and only way. So you need to reject all other ways and put your faith in Jesus. Be a Christian. A Christian is simply a person who has faith that they are going to heaven because of Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus and nothing else. Understand who he is and what he's done for you. He is God, eternal God Almighty, who became a man in order to die for our sins. He did die for our sins on that cross. He paid for your sins and he buried him. But on the third day, he raised, he was raised bodily back to life. And he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. And that bodily resurrection is the proof Jesus offers us. It's the sign that his claims were true. He is God. He is the Savior. He is the sole source of life everlasting. And if you put your faith in this person, Jesus, believe who he is and what he's done for you. Rely on him. Trust him completely. And at that instant, you get the gift of eternal life. Salvation is a gift, the Bible says. It's not something you work for and earn. It's something that Jesus paid for and offers you as a gift. And then once you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says it's irrevocable and irreversible. So when I put my faith in Jesus in December of 1986, um, no matter whatever happened in my life after that point, I, I never had to worry that uh, my, my salvation was ever in question or I could ever be lost because if Jesus promised I'm going to go to heaven if I would just trust him. God cannot revoke it. God cannot lie. God cannot break his promise. So I'm confident I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything good I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. I hope you put your faith in him too. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.